to section um, section 2.4 is on the difference quotient and derivative so this will be the last of our limit type of sections after this section will be focused on what we're calling a derivative which we'll learn in a second and it's based on limits like you might expect uh, what we'll do is we'll talk about the average rate of change which is something you've seen before but maybe in a different way uh, then we'll talk about the definition of the derivative and then the last little bit once we have an idea of what the derivative means we'll want to know when a graph is not what we call a differential meaning there's not a derivative at a spot and we'll look at the key the main ideas for that at the very end all right so the first thing the average rate of change all of this comes from the equation for the slope of a line so we know the slope of the line a slope of a line if we have two points on a line let's say we have you know, x1 y1 is one of our points and x2 y2 is another one of our points and that makes those connect in a straight line then that just is perfectly straight then the slope m is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 all right so you're probably very familiar with that we even did that earlier in this class we've seen it a million times that is the equation for the slope of a line sometimes you might see it written as delta x or delta y over delta x meaning the change in y which is the rise and delta x is the change in x this triangle it's the greek letter delta it means change in so this is y2 minus y1 is delta y x2 minus x1 is delta x and so we can extend this idea we don't need to have a line to talk about the average rate of change and so the average rate of change you imagine you have any graph at all and since we know this word now let's say it's continuous meaning we can draw it without lifting up our pencil say so we have this graph it's not a line but we can talk about the average rate of change between two points let's say x1 is there and the corresponding y1 but since we're dealing with a function usually we'll talk about f of x1 and then let's say x2 is here the corresponding y value over here is y2 or f of x2 then what the average rate of change is this is the slope of the line we would have if we connected the two points together so one way you can kind of think about this if the y value is like the speed of your car and the x values are the time then your your the speed of your car over here might be 10 this is zero and then you slow down and then finally you're out of traffic and you speed back up and then you're going 50 at some other time then whatever the slope is between these two lines that will give you the average rate of change uh, but we can figure out the formula for the average rate of change since it's the slope um, usually we don't actually use m so let me not use that to avoid confusion um, and usually we write as f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1 
All right now usually what we're going to do when we start talking about the next section is instead of having um, <clears throat> x1 and x2 we'll have x1 and then over here instead of x2 we'll have x1 plus h and then h is just the positive number And we'll see that in a second. So the average rate of change is the same as this formula, f of x1 plus h instead of x2 minus f of x1 over x1 plus h minus x1. Now what I boxed in here We'll actually refer to it as the slope of the secant line. So that's the same as the average rate of change. Slope of the secant line is the same as the average rate of change. And that's the formula. All right, so what we'll do is we'll work one where it's just numbers and then we'll do the H thing because it does look kind of confusing, but all we're doing is trying to figure out the average rate of change or slope of the secant line. All right, so we have our function f of x equals 5x minus x squared. It's definitely not a line, so you can't just look at the slope here. And you're told to evaluate f of 2 minus f of 1 over 2 minus 1. Now what I recommend doing is figuring out f of 2 and f of 1 on the side and then plug in and simplify. The reason for that is, especially when we get to when we introduce h here, you're gonna definitely want to do them on the side. If you don't, it's a lot to write at once, and it's easy to mess up. Right, so f of two, we plug in two for x. We got five times two minus two squared. Five times two is ten. Two squared is four. F of two equals six. And f of one, we plug in one. We got five times one minus one squared. 5 times 1 is 5, minus 1 squared is 1, that is 4. All right, so now we plug in. I'm just going to rewrite f of 2 minus f of 1 over 2 minus 1. Yes, you could have simplified 2 minus 1 to 1 because they are just numbers. And then f of 2 was 6 minus f of 1, which is 4. And 6 minus 4 is 2. 2 over 1 equals 2. So that is the slope of the secant line or the average rate of change of f of x from 1 to 2. From x equals 1 to x equals 2. I don't know why I keep wanting to write these subscripts. Now the next one, instead of having 1 and 2, it has 1 and 1 plus h. And you, the h is a variable, you can't plug in a number for it. So we want to do exactly what we did before. We want to plug in each of these after we figure them out. So we want f of 1 plus h. And f of 1, we already figured out, it's the same function, that is 4. But 1 plus h, what that means is we want to plug in 1 plus h for x. So we have 5 times 1 plus h minus 1 plus h squared. 
Now we need to simplify it. We want to distribute the 5 through since there's no powers on here. And this thing, we are squaring. We're going to multiply it by itself. What does, that's what it means to square. So we got 5 times 1 is 5 plus 5 times h is 5h minus 1 plus h times 1 plus h. And once you work enough of these, you'll, re you'll notice that squaring means you're going to foil the thing with itself. So it's very important to foil and simplify. You don't want to leave anything unsimplified. We got 5 plus 5h in the front. Minus, since we have this minus out front, just put everything in a parentheses. 1 times 1 is 1. 1 times h is h, h times 1 is h, and h times h is h squared. Right, and now distribute the negative through. So we got 5 plus 5h in the front. We got minus 1. We have h plus h is 2h, but we're going to put a minus on it, so minus 2h minus h squared. And then simplify 5 minus 1 is 4. 5h minus 2h is 3h. And then h squared has nothing else in common. It's its own thing, so minus h squared. So the, the hard part with these problems when we go through and do them all is definitely going to be this part. But now we can plug them in. Now if you notice the denominator, the ones cancel out so it's just h. In the numerator we have 4 plus 3h minus h squared, and then minus f of 1, which is 4. Now simplify it. The 4 and the minus 4 cancel each other out. We got 3h minus h squared over h. And now here's one thing that will always happen when you deal with these is you should be able to factor h out and cancel. There might be some examples where it doesn't factor out perfectly or it looks a little different, but in this one we can factor an h out. We have an h in common up top, and we have when we take the h out of the front, we have 3. When we take an h out of the second part, we have an h left. And the h is canceled. And we are left with our final answer of 3 minus h. And that is our final answer. So what you can actually notice here is if h was 1, that's when we got we would have 1 plus 1 is 2. And that would be exactly what we were asking in the first part. If we have h equals 1 plugged in here, then we would get our 2 back. So it works out. The formula should be correct. And it is. But when you figure out the stuff with H's in them, you know, something like this, it's not going to go away. All right, so that is the slope of a secant line. It's important, but it's not important as what we're about to deal with, and it, what we're about to deal with just builds on it a little bit. What we're about to do is look at the definition of the derivative, which is the slope of the tangent line. So it's really just going to be the slope of the secant line with one little limit added. And it's honestly the easiest thing to do. This, what we've already done, is the harder thing to do. Um, but this, the derivative, is something we'll be studying for a very long time in this class, most of the class. 
And the idea behind the tangent line is its slope is to bring the two points for the secant line closer and closer together until they become the same point. So I'll draw a visual. Um, I'll just refer back to this real quickly. Imagine if this x2 was closer and closer and closer so that the point on the graph here we get closer and closer and closer to x1. Then the slope would be changing. When it shrinks into and becomes x1, that's what our tangent line is. So I'll draw a picture for this after the video is over, but I like the animation that Wikipedia has more. And I'll just let you let this run through a couple of times. So what you see is that this is like our x1 over here. It's the one not moving. Our x2 is the one that's moving along the graph. It's becoming closer and closer to x1. That's actually a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be. Uh, but as we get closer and closer to x1, right here at this point, right there at the end, I can't pause it. That's when we get the slope of the tangent line. So the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. The derivative is a special limit. And in fact, what you'll notice here is that h is where we had um, this delta x is. So what we're saying is the limit as h goes to 0 of the average rate of change. So once again, I'll draw a picture in here um, for the notes, but the animation does a much better job than I can. Uh, Wikipedia has more pictures about this, um, the derivative. So it has this one right here. And what's going on here is that we have our x plus h. What they're doing is they have the x plus h. And then the next one, the next pink line below here, this one is x plus h prime, just getting smaller. And then they make h even smaller, and it gets we get this slope. And when it shrinks down, it becomes this brown line. And so what the uh, slope of the tangent line looks like, it looks like it's just touching the graph. Let's see if this one... You can see another animation, and at the very end, where h equals 0, it's just touching it. Two, one, and if I could pause it, just touching it, not crossing it. All right, so that is the main idea of the tangent line. All right, so with this, we can think of the derivative as the limit as h goes to 0 of the slope of the secant line, but we'll use x instead of x1. For this definition, this is very important. Pretty much all the formulas that we deal with with the derivative are built on this formula. And it's based on limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So what I'll note from before is that x plus h minus x would be the denominator, but that simplifies to h. I'll just scroll back up real quickly. All right, the same. It's the same as this with x instead of x1. And the denominator of the x1s or the x's would cancel, and we'll just have h. All right, so to see this in action, we'll just build on the previous problem and then break down the steps. Um, it says, let f of x equals 5x minus x squared. Same function as before. Evaluate the derivative f prime of 1, which equals the limit as h goes to 0, f of 1 plus h minus f of 1 over h. All right, so what we'll point out here that we did the part without the limit first. 
And so f of 1 plus h minus f of 1 over h, right, because the 1s would cancel, becomes 3 minus h. So to do the derivative, it's just one extra step. We want to do the limit as h goes to 0 of 3 minus h. So once you figure out the inside, you kind of ignore the limit until you simplify the inside. And then we know how to deal with limits. Since it's not piecewise, we plug in h equals 0, we get 3 minus 0, which is 3. So f prime of 1, the rate of change of this function at 1 is 3. Now I'll kind of, I'll graph this in the calculator so you can see what this sort of means. Once it opens up. All right, so what I'm going to do is graph our function f of x equals 5x minus x squared. And it zooms 6. And where x equals 1, Right here, the slope is 3. Let me zoom in a little bit. I'm going to zoom in where x equals 1 on the graph. Right. And here is at 1. The slope here is, is going to be 3 if you make a point here. And tried to look at the slope of the line there. Um, your calculator can also, if you graph, do it. Uh, we haven't talked about it, we'll see in a second, but this is the notation for the derivative dy over dx. And if you plug in x equals 1, the derivative is 3. So it is correct. But you're not going to really want to do this on your calculator very much because it's complicated. You have to find the graph. You have to look at where it is, make sure your x value and your y value is correct. And then if it's a weird fraction or a weird decimal, you don't know what that fraction is. All right, so what we'll do is outlining, computing the derivative this way. It really breaks down into four steps. The first step is by far the longest. What you do is you compute and simplify f of x plus h. So this part right here. You'll recall the f of 1 plus h is what took us a long time before. Simplify that. Then finish the numerator. So take your simplified f of x plus h and subtract off the f of x and simplify that. Then divide it by h and simplify that. I'll send a reminder here what we did. Usually this means we're going to factor and cancel on h. And then the last part is what we just did. Take the limit of the simplified expression in step 3. If you do not simplify as you go, this step will always give you 0 over 0 as a limit, which we talked about as indeterminate. So you have to make sure you factor, factor and cancel. All right, so we got three examples here. Um, this first one is the easiest type of example because the graph is a line. In fact, we should know that since the derivative is just this slope, that it should be 5. But let's make sure by practicing. 
So I'm going to write the formula on the top. This is a formula you need to memorize. You're not going to be given it. f prime of x equals the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And the first step we want to do is compute f of x plus h and simplify it. So we look at our function here. Everywhere we see x, we replace it with x plus h. And then simplify it. We want to distribute the 5 through. We got 5x plus 5h, then minus 3. And this is simplified. There's no like terms to combine. All right, so the second part is to complete the numerator. We want to now subtract off f of x from our f of x plus h. All right, so make sure you take the simplified from part 1, which is 5x plus 5h minus 3, and we subtract off f of x, which is 5x minus 3. It's very important you do not forget the parentheses when you subtract because you're going to need to distribute the minus through. So let's go ahead and distribute the minus through. And we got 5x plus 5h minus 3, and then minus 5x plus 3. Switch is the sign there. Now when you do this, in most uh, examples, a lot should cancel out. 5x and negative 5x cancel. Negative 3 and positive 3 cancel. And when all that cancels out, we're left with just 5h. Right, then the third step is to complete the fraction. Now we've got the numerator. We want to divide it by h. So our simplified numerator was 5h. Divide that by h. And normally we need to try to factor and cancel, but there's nothing to factor. We can just cancel the h's out. And we're left with just 5. And then the last and final step is to do the limit, which really is plug in h equals 0. So the limit as h goes to 0 of this whole thing is, well, this whole thing simplifies to just 5. And when you do the limit of just a number, it's always just the number, it's just 5, because there's no h there. It doesn't matter what we plug in here, because there's nothing to plug in for. Number two, second one, this one is very similar to the one we did earlier with the one plus h, but it's good to practice. So we have f of x equals two minus two x squared. I'm not use that color yet. So we wanna do the same four step process, f of x plus h and simplify. So we got two minus two, in place of x, we have x plus h squared. We got 2 minus 2. x plus h squared means multiply it by itself. And we just want to simplify like we did before. Foil this out, leave the minus 2 in front, and then distribute afterwards. 
Now you don't want to try to distribute that minus 2 through because it's just going to make it more complicated and you you know the more steps you do the more there's a chance to make a mistake. All right, so if we FOIL this we get x times x is x squared x times h is x times h h times x is h times x and h times h is h squared and now we want to simplify this. I'm going to simplify this first before dealing with the other part so x squared and h squared are already camp are simplified because there's no common terms but x times h and h times x are the same thing because the order of multiplication doesn't matter so we could have x times h or h times x for both the recommendation is to just make it one thing so if you want to think about h times x as x times h we have two of them to combine and then plus h squared and now I'll distribute the minus 2 through. Right, be careful, don't be tricked and subtract 2 minus 2 because this 2 is stuck to all this stuff, this 2 is not stuck to anything. So you have to make sure you do it in the correct order. Alright, so we got 2 in front. Negative 2 times x squared is negative 2x squared. Negative 2 times 2xh is negative 4xh. And negative 2 times h squared is negative 2h squared. All right. Finally, this one is simplified. There's no like terms. You see this is x squared. This is x times h. This is h squared. No like terms, so this is simplified. All right now, once again, the, set, the first step is very often, not always, but very often the long step. The rest is just simplifying, canceling out. So we want to complete our numerator, f of x plus h minus f of x. Take our part from simplified thing from part 1. And then subtract off f of x. Don't forget, once again, do not forget this parentheses to make sure you distribute it through. Kind of low, let me move that. Minus sign. And then we want to simplify this. So distribute the minus sign to get rid of the parentheses. So we got 2 minus 2x squared minus 4xh minus 2h squared. Distribute the 2, we got minus 2. Or sorry, distribute the minus sign, we got minus 2, and then plus 2x squared. Once again, not always, but very often, a lot will cancel out. Here, the 2 and the minus 2 cancel, and the negative 2x squared and the positive 2x squared cancel. And then I'm just going to write what we have left. Negative 4xh minus 2h squared. Once again, we are now simplified here. There's no like terms. This is x times h, and this is h squared. So the third step is when we complete our fraction and divide by h, what we got in step two. So let's go ahead and fill that out. We got our numerator from part two, divide by h. And remember what you're looking for, you need an h to cancel out. Because we need to plug in h to zero next, and then we can't see in the bottom. So remember to factor out what you can. Here we can factor out an h. You don't need to factor out the 2 unless you really want to. We don't need to here. So we take out the h from the first thing. We got negative 4x. Take out the h from the second thing. We got negative 2h. Right. And then we can cancel the h's out. And we got negative 4x minus 2h. So remember the very last step is the easiest one. You plug in h equals 0. You do the limit. And so I'm going to write it formally. 
we want to do the limit as h goes to 0 of negative 4x minus 2h. The easiest thing to make a mistake here is just automatically plug in 0 for x because you're so used to plugging in for x. But make sure you only plug in for h. x is very often going to be in the final answer. So we have negative 4x minus 2 times 0, which is negative 4x. And that is f prime of x, the derivative of x, f of x. Right, so let me write a little comment here. Just only plug in h equals 0. All right, so one thing I just remembered we didn't do in the first part and I need to do is to figure out f prime of 3. All, right, all this means is after you figure out f prime of x, plug in x equals 3. All right, so for number 1, We got f prime of x was 5. Well, f prime of 3, since there's no x there, we can't plug in an x. So it's still 5. Right. It's just like when you have a function and that function is just a number, no matter what you plug in, you always get out that number. Same thing here. Right, now for this one, we do have an x. So f prime of 3, we want to plug in 3 for x into f prime of x. And negative 4 times 3 is negative 12. That is our answer. So our, this is our f prime of x, this is our f prime of 3. Right, so just a recap before we move on to the last one. If you want to figure out the derivative, do the four-step process. You'll have a formula. Very often you'll have some x or maybe even more than one x left. And then if you want to get the derivative at a point, we plug in the number after we get the formula. All right, we don't want to plug in x equals 3 at any point before this. That's a bad habit. Don't do it anywhere here. Do it afterwards. So this last one is definitely more challenging than the first two. Anytime you have a fraction and you're trying to do the derivative, it's a little more complicated. But it is important to learn how to do this. You don't want to not be able to do it for anything except, you know, perfect functions. All right, so first step, if we want to get f prime of x, we want to get f of x plus h. We got 9 plus 3 over x plus h. Now, one thing the question is, is this simplified? I would say this is simplified. There's nothing in common to add together. So this is gonna this is gonna be one of the examples where the really <clears throat> the bulk of the work isn't in the first step. It's actually gonna be in the second step. So we want to do f of x plus h minus f of x. We have our simplified f of x plus h, 9 plus 3x plus h, and we want to subtract off f of x, which is 9 plus 3 over x. All right, so right away, oops, I did a bad thing, got my parentheses. Right away, we want to do the same thing as before. We want to distribute the minus sign through and see what's really obvious to simplify. So we got 9 plus 3 over x plus h. 
Now we sub distribute the minus, we get minus 9 minus 3 over x. The 9 and minus 9 cancel out, which is great. And we're left with 3 over x plus h minus 3 over x. Now one thing I'll say here is you're going to have to make one fraction by getting a common denominator here. We might as well do it now. Right, so in order to get a common denominator here, if you multiply the opposite fraction by the denominator of the other one on the top and bottom, it will work. If that sounded like a mouthful, what I'm saying is this first fraction here, multiply by x over x. And then the second fraction, the opposite denominator is x plus h, so we'll multiply by x plus h over x plus h. And if you're wondering why I'm putting parentheses around some things and not the other, you have to make sure you distribute the correct things. I would actually put parentheses around that x plus h as well. Right, now we want to multiply each fraction. The, the first fraction we multiply the tops, we get 3 or x times 3 is 3x. And the denominator, x times x plus h. And I'm going to actually leave this alone and not distribute the x through. You can if you want, but it's not necessary. All right, and we got minus. And then in the second part, we have x plus h times 3. If you distribute the 3 through, we got minus 3x plus 3h. Remember that minus is out front, it's not on the fraction. And then on the bottom, we have x times x plus h, same thing as the other one. So we've got a common denominator now. Now we can make it into one fraction. So we got 3x minus the minus signs out front of the fraction here, so it's got to go to both parts, either distribute it or write a parentheses and then distribute it over the common denominator of x times x plus h. And then we finally have one fraction here. Simplify the numerator by distributing and getting rid of anything in common. That will cancel. And this is definitely the long part. After this, it's pretty quick. So we distribute the minus through. We get 3x minus 3x minus 3h over x times x plus h. And the 3x and minus 3x cancel out. And finally, for this part, it feels like we did a whole problem here. Not minus 3h over x times x plus h. All right, so this is the simplified numerator, simplified part 2. Let me go ahead. I'm just going to sketch around here so we don't accidentally get confused. And then part three is taking our fraction or our numerator and dividing it by h. So we take our numerator here, negative 3h over x times x plus h, and then we divide that by h. Something should cancel like with the before. You cannot leave the H's here. 
I mean, there might still be some H's, but this H cannot stay here. The best thing to do is think about the bottom H as H over 1. Think about it as a fraction. And that way we have a fraction over a fraction. And you can simplify using keep, change, flip. Now, if you're not familiar with that, what you know, by words you should at least be familiar with what I'm about to do. We change the division to multiplication by flipping the denominator. So we have our top fraction, negative 3h over x times x plus h. Switch the division to multiplication and then flip the bottom 1 over h. And now you can see the H's here cancel. One's on the top, one's on the bottom. And we are left with negative 3 times 1 on the top, which is just negative 3, over X times X plus H. And then finally, the last step to finish, part 4. Plug in H equals 0. We got negative 3. We're doing the limit to be formal. Over x times x plus h from before, we plug in h is 0. We get negative 3 over x times x plus 0. And the bottom is just x times x, which is x squared. Okay, and that is f prime of x. We did our four steps. The last thing to do the, is the limit, and then we have our answer. And then if you have, if part of the question is to figure out the derivative at a value, we'll do that. So f prime of 3, we take our f of x, f prime of x, and we plug in 3 for x. 3 squared is 9. We got negative 3 over 9 equals negative 1 over 3. Simplified. So the graph of this thing is a little messy. If you were to graph it and try to figure out the slope at 3, you'll get negative 1 third. For most of what we do in this class, we will do the derivative first and then if we want the derivative at values, we'll do that afterwards. All right, so that's really the main thing from this section, but there are a couple more little things. There's not going to be too much left. So we talked about tangent lines already. Uh, one of the things we're going to want to be able to do is figure out the equation of tangent lines in this class. Okay. And this is what I was hinting at before in the very first section. When we deal with lines in this section or in this class, it's mainly going to be tangent lines and we're going to be using point slope form. So that is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So what's very often going to happen is you're going to do the derivative to get the slope and then plug in that point. Right, so what we have here is a problem just practicing with point slope form and um, finding the equation of a tangent line. Uh, this time where you know this section we're going to be told what the slope is we're just going to practice using the formula correctly. It says for f of x equals 1 over 1 plus x squared, the slope of the graph of y equals f of x is known to be negative 1 half. And I forgot because you have to be given the x value at x equals 1. 
find the equation of the tangent line at that point. All right, so as soon as you see find the equation of the tangent line at that point, you want to think of point slope form y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Now the problem gives you the slope right here. The slope is one negative one half. So m equals negative one half is what we want to plug in. And we're also told x1, the value for x plug in. x1 equals one. Right, so we know when we want to find the equation of a line using point slope form, we want to plug in y1, m, and x1. We need y1. But the way we get y1 is by plugging in our x1 to f of x. Okay, so we've got 1 over 1 plus 1 squared. We got 1 over 1 plus 1 squared is 1, and 1 plus 1 is 2. So recap, we get the equation of a tangent line. You get the slope, you get the x1, which will always be given to you, and you plug the x1 into the original to get the y1. So now we plug those three things into here. You really don't have to simplify when you do these. So we got y minus y1 is 1 half equals negative 1 half times x minus x1, which is 1. And I am more than happy with this answer. If you want to simplify it to points or slope intercept form, meaning solve for y, you can do that, but it's not necessary at all. But you know how to do that if needed. All right, so this one is just another practice with the equation of the tangent line. It says determine the equation of the tangent line at the point 3 comma f of 3 on the graph of y equals 2 minus 2x squared. The tangent line once again y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. And we want to know what is m, what is x1, it's a weird looking x, and what is y1. Well, x1 is given in the problem. It always has to be. It is 3. And y1 is what we get when we plug in 3 to the original. So we got 2 minus 2 times 3 squared. 3 squared is 9 times 2 is 18. And 2 minus 18 is negative 16. So our slope m is going to be f prime of 3. That's what the derivative is for. It tells you the slope of the tangent line. And we actually computed this. This was number 2 above. So I'm going to scroll up here. So when f of x equals negative 2x squared, f prime of 3, we don't want to redo all that work again because we already did it f prime of 3 is negative 12. From above. And, and now just plug it in like last time and either you know, solve for y or that's good enough. So we got y minus y1 which is negative 16 equals m negative 12 times x minus x1 which is 3. Now one thing I would say you need to at least do is turn double negatives into positive so we got y plus 16 equals negative 12 times x minus 3. All right this is simplified enough for me.
or you can get to slope-intercept form by solving for y. So we've got one word problem. Um, just you know, kind of understanding what the um, derivative tells us in words. Uh, one thing I'll say is most of this is exactly the same as far as doing the four-step process and average rate of change. The main thing I'm going to want to focus on here is part C. But we'll go through all the steps. Right, and the last thing, like I said, we have a word problem here. It's very useful because we talked about the derivative. We talked about it being like a rate of change or a slope. But in terms of business, what is it telling us? So here's a question dealing with the revenue of selling car seats. Right, it says the revenue in dollars from the sale of X cars, car seats for infants is given by the following function. R of X equals 56 X squared minus 0 0.020 X, or sorry, 56 X minus 0 0.020 X squared and X is between zero and 2,800. All, right, all this means is that they only sell between that many car seats as long as you know the number they're asking is between 0 and 2800 we use this formula which it will be now part a says find the average cha change in revenue if the production has changed from 1000 to 1003 car seats so the average change in revenue is going to be the average rate of change formula we have r of 1050 minus r of 1000 over 1050 minus 1000 now what I'll do is I'll go ahead and just figure out the r 1050 and 1000 in the calculator okay so we want to plug in 1050 for x we have 56 times 1050 minus 0 0.020 times 1050 squared we get 36,750 minus and then we want to plug in a thousand to the same thing little shortcut if you hit second enter it'll read um, reshow what you typed and then you can just change the 1050 to a thousand if that's easier for you and that gives us 3600 or sorry 36,000 and on the bottom 1050 minus 1000 equals 50 All right so now on the top here 36,750 minus 36,000 is 750 over 50 and 750 divided by 50 is 15. So the average rate of change is 15 car seats per um, <coughs> excuse me sorry the average rate of change is 15 dollars per car seat And so next we want to use the four-step process to find the derivative. Now the numbers are messier here, so I'm going to go through it a little quick, but it's just like a couple of the other problems we did before. First we want to do r of x plus h. Everywhere we see x, we do x plus h. And we want to simplify the same way. Distribute the 56 through. We get 56x plus 56h minus 0 
and x plus h squared is x plus h times x plus h. And now FOIL that out, just like from before. We got 56x plus 56h minus 0 0.020. And if you FOIL that out, you'll get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. You'll probably memorize this working a few of them. If you multiply x plus h times x plus h, you get that. which we saw before a couple times. Right, now we distribute the negative 0 0.020 through. And we got 56x plus 56h minus 0 0.020x squared minus 0 0.040xh because of the 2 minus 0 0.020h squared. And as messy as this is, this is simplified. There are no like terms. This has just x, just h, x squared, x h, and h squared. All right, so now we want to just um, subtract off the remainder of the numerator. We have r of x plus h, and we do minus r of x. So we got to write that long r of x plus h that we just got. 56x plus 56h minus 0.020x squared minus 0.040h, or x times h, minus 0.020x squared. And then we subtract off, don't forget our parentheses, r of x, which is 56x minus 0 0.020x squared. And since we're subtracting them off, you can also, you've noticed that they've been canceling. It's because when we have 56, we subtract out the 56x. The negative 0 0.020x squared, we subtract that same thing off, so it cancels. And we are left with 56h minus 0.040xh minus 0.020h squared. And now the third step is to divide by h. We take our numerator and divide by h. So what we got in the previous part. And just like from before, you want to factor an H out, you should be able to unless you messed up, and cancel. So we take the H out of the front and we have 56. We take the H out of the middle term and we have negative 0.040x. And we take the H out of the second term and we got negative 0.020h. And we cancel the H's out. And then finally, the last step, we plug in H equals 0. And we do the limit. So we got 56 minus 0 0.040x minus 0 0.020 times 0. And that'll go away. We're left with 56 minus 0.040x. And that is our r prime of x. Now the main thing I want to do here is it says find the revenue and instantaneous rate of change of revenue at a production level of 1,000 car seats and interpret the results. So the revenue 
at 1,000, R of 1,000. We actually did that in the first part. It was 36,000. We did that before. The R of 1,000 was 36,000. Now the instantaneous rate of change of revenue, that's the derivative. We got our R prime of 1,000. And what we want to do is plug in 1,000. for x and our r prime of x. If you do that, the 1,000 here makes this 40. 56 minus 40 is 16. And then we want to interpret the results. What does this mean? This means, in words, uh, combining what these two things are saying, the revenue at 1,000 car seats is, we'll assume that it's in dollars, so $36,000 and increases by $16 for each extra car seat. That's a rough estimation of what this means. What the derivative tells you is how much that function is changing. So R prime of 1,000 equals 16 means that the revenue, since it's positive, is increasing by $16 at x equals 1,000. That is the interpretation of the derivative. And we'll have we'll pretty much have a one or two word problems in every section just practicing what the interpretation means because that's really what's important. All right, so the last little thing, there's it's really just um, what a graph looks like to be differentiable. Um, typically graphs are differentiable if they are smooth. Um, it's easier to talk about what's not differentiable. So there are three things that are common to, to talk about where a graph is not differential, meaning it's not smooth. So if it's not continuous, discontinuity, it's not differentiable at that point. So what it looks like, continuous means you have to you know, pick up, you, know, you don't have to pick up your pencil when you draw it. So think about discontinuous. We had some examples in the previous section. We have our graph and we have a break and then it continues on. So let's give this a the number C. So this is a graph not differentiable at x equals C since it is not continuous. at x equals c. It's fine everywhere else. So what I mean by smooth is that you're just kind of drawing it and it looks good. Um, so this is the easiest thing to way to see that a graph is not differentiable is there's like a jump. Um, this one is, it kind of looks weird in some sense, but it is a different kind of example, a sharp point. Uh, if you remember the absolute value graph, it looks like a V. Very different for, from a parabola, which looks like a U. At this sharp point where they come together, that is not differentiable at this sharp point.
and the kind of the way to think about it is it's two lines with different slopes connecting. It's continuous. We don't have to lift up our pencil to draw it, but it's a sharp point. It's not differential there. Now the last example of a graph that is not differential at a point is a vertical tangent line. This is definitely the hardest one to get used to. Um, and I'll draw a picture of one So anytime the graph gets vertical, meaning it looks like it's going straight up or down, that's not a use color, something like this here. So the tangent line is vertical because The graph looks vertical at a point. It almost always looks like this sideways S sort of shape. It is not differentiable there. Right, pretty much everything else is differentiable. Right. Anywhere along on, on this V-shaped graph, this is fine. Anything over here on the left, anything over here on the right is differentiable. It's just at this sharp point. The vertical tangent line example I drew, it's fine everywhere else. There's kind of riding along, it's fine. But then when it gets vertical, it's not differentiable. But then it's fine again. Pretty much what's going to happen in this class is we're going to have formulas and everything to figure out the derivative of a lot of different functions, and the formula will tell us where it's differentiable or not.